Thank you. Good evening, everybody from the Philippines. My task for this evening is to share with you what had been the experience of the Philippines in putting together the um, Philippine, Urba Philippine National Urban Mobility Program. I'll talk about why that has changed. But if you notice that um, it is included, if you notice that before the PU, the Philippine National Urban Mobility Plan, you'd actually see Bayanihan. But what is Bayanihan? I'd like to just share with you that Bayanihan in the Philippines literally means being in a community. Hence, it invokes the spirit of communal unity and cooperation. So that was actually the spirit on which the Philippine National Urban Mobility Plan, or the POM, was put together. So the outline of my, of my presentation would be I'd talk about the challenges in urban transport system in the Philippines, our way forward in doing the Philippine Urban Mobility Program, current interventions, which are actually also anchored on the pump, and a little bit about our convergence to e-mobility, as well as the challenges faced and solutions that have been implemented in the Philippine context. All right, let me start with the challenges in urban transportation development, like any other urban centers in, in the Philippines, um, where you know that the United Nations Environmental Program has actually, for, uh, has actually estimated that more than 50% of our population are actually residing in urban centers. And the Philippines is not far behind. As you can see, um, as you can see on the map, you can actually see that in 1929, the Philippines had an urban population of about 29% which then grew to about 45% in 2015. By 2050, it is projected that the urban population of the Philippines will reach 60%, thus increasing mobility demand in our urban centers. But what does that mean? That actually means that we can no longer rely on private vehicles to serve mobility needs of people. What we need to have is an efficient public transportation as the backbone of urban mobility. Uh, let's look at the Philippine context. You know, the Philippines is, is in a way um, in a good place for an urban mobility plan because, as you can see, it has a high modal share of um, public transport, right? So it, it does have a lot, of, a lot of people use public transport. It can range, depending on the city, can range between about 50% to 70%. And please note also that in this in this particular um, data, you would have number of this is public mode, and you'd also have walking, which is when we talk about um, low carbon transport systems, we need to also talk about talk about active transport. We cannot just rely on vehicles. We've been talking about vehicles earlier, but more than that, because since transport is moving people, we actually need to actually actually look at how else can people move? So active transport is also a component when we talk about the Philippine urban, well, the urban mobility plan. There are other inefficiencies that are inherent in the Philippine system, one of which is the bo sporadic boarding and alighting. Um, and if you have been to the Philippines, you probably see uh, the jeepneys dropping off and um, picking up passengers anywhere they see because the revenue is actually based on the number of passengers carried. Another challenge in the urban, uh, in, in urban mobility in the Philippines is, of course, the contribution of the transport sector in GHG, or greenhouse gas emissions. In 2016, GHG by sector, transport, as you can see, was the third largest contributor of greenhouse gas next to agriculture and energy sector. And then of all the four sectors, uh, all, of all the transport sector, the road sector is by far the largest contributor, followed by the maritime sector, the rail sector, as well as the aviation sector. Therefore, it was timely that we actually started looking at the Philippine Urban Mobility Program. Let me just, um, say that this is not probably the first foray of the Philippines in moving towards environmentally sustainable transport. Because back in 2009, the Department of Transportation and Communications did come up 
with a um, national ESP strategy. Unfortunately, because of the change of administration, this fell through the cracks. That's why the PUB, the, the PU, the POM or the Philippine Urban Mobility Program was a timely intervention. Now the Philippine, or the POM is, um, has a vision towards, uh, and I think Dr. La said this earlier, that it has a vision towards people first cities, empowered by efficient, dignified and sustainable mobility. You know, dignified is very important when you talk about access to transport. This means that people of different abilities can actually take public transportation in an orderly manner. So dignity of travel is an important component when you talk about your urban mobility plan. It is also supported by the social, environment, and economic objectives and indicators. It's never just one. It's always this tripartite of, of, of factors that you have to look at. The POM actually propo also proposes a strategic action-oriented framework for sustainable urban mobility. It also supports and operationalizes the national transport policy. The national transport policy is the main policy in the Philippines that supports and guides transportation de system development. And it was enacted back in 2017, 2018. All right, let's walk through how we actually came, how we uh, developed our form. It started as far back as 2017. We started with um, awareness raising because it's very important for people to understand what it is all about, right? So it started with awareness setting, and then we moved to partnerships with government agencies, including understanding the policies that are already in place to determine what other policies should actually be, um, uh, should actually be put together. And then once you know the institutional framework, so to speak, then we start moving towards data collection. So the third step in 2017 was actually uh, a, the, the in, con conduct of the inventory and status quo of the, uh, of the emission from the transport sector. And then in 2018, we then moved to consultations with key stakeholders, both from the national and the local government. Uh, I, um, so th these are consultations that have been done right? And then we also had um, study tours, study trips for policymakers. What is that for? It's actually to enable policymakers to imbibe the full extent of the transfer, the transformation that the POM actually embodies. And then after we have had consultations, then we move to the integration of the Philippine um, urban mobility plan in the Philippine transport context. One very important uh, story I'd like to share is that during the interagency technical committee on transport planning, it was actually, um, it was actually suggested that instead of using NUM, okay, the National Urban Mobility Program, we use POMP to show the vigor of the plan. All right, so that's precisely why it became POMP. Okay. Earlier on also, there was a lot of talk about stakeholders that have to be uh, included in the entire process of coming up with a comprehensive urban mobility plan, right? Because as I said earlier, it's Maya Nihan, it's a whole of community approach. So I'd like to just share that this is the um, transport sector roadmap, a uh, stakeholder map. So you have, of course, the Department of Transportation. The Department of Energy, because we do work with a lot with them uh, because of fuel and other energy needs. The National Economic and Development Authority is the um, supervising, so to speak. It's the overall policy-making agency. So it, it looks at whether all the, all the plans of the different agencies are actually coordinated, right? And then under this, we have the Department of Transportation, GHG inventory team. Um, uh, by the way, in the, in the department now, we even have a nationally determined contribution and NDC team as well. So we would have people to focus on this particular uh, issue. 
Of course, we'll have technical support. This was also earlier emphasized. The need to actually work with academe, uh, of course, the National Center for Transport Studies, of which, uh, with which I'm a, a, still a, a research fellow, and national government, uh, orga non-government organizations and civil service organizations. I'll have a breakdown of these in the next slide. This is just the general lay of the land. And these are the peaks, these are the groups who were actually included in the process. As you can see, it's color coded. You've got government. Of course, the pink one is those that are under the Department of Transportation. We also talked to the public, okay? Uh, so the public here would be the road users, right? So the pedestrians, the freight drivers, the public transport users, the cyclists, right? We needed to include them in the discussion so that we would understand their perspective on how urban mobility should be. And then we also talked to the private sector. These are usually the, the transport service providers, right? So the public transport operators, the vehicle manufacturers, the real estate developers, because later on I'll discuss a bit about transport or yeah, transit oriented development as well as the delivery services. With such a comprehensive um, stakeholder consultation, this is now the final form of the buy-in um, Now in the interest of time, I'm not gonna go through each one of them, but I'd rather just focus on an important component of it, which looks at non-motorized transport and public transport. Uh, by the way, I know that everybody knows that non-motorized transport is, has now been relabeled to active transport to emphasize the importance or the benefits of actually adopting that particular mode of transport. All right, so what has happened therefore? Based on that, we the pandemic has actually been, although it's been very tragic for the most part, but it has also given the department or the community that chance to look at active transport as a viable option for mobility of people. So because of the pandemic, the department strongly encourages cycling and other modes of non-motorized transport and personal mobility devices as an alternative travel mode that is to implement social distancing. All right, under the Bayanihan II, that means that the Senate, the Philippine government through the Senate has actually provided the uh, department with funds to build around 522 kilometers of bikeways in three key cities. And I think we are now at 80% in terms of, um, of completion. Aside from the active transport or the bikeways, I'd like to also share with you the nationally determined contributions, unconditional intervention that the department submitted to the Climate Change Commission in 2019, right? So if, if you look at this, the objective, of course, is to reduce greenhouse gas from the transport sector through transport fleet modernization, modal shift, and infrastructure. If you remember earlier on, I said of all the four sectors of, of the transport, it's actually road that is the highest contributor. So if you notice also the nationally determined contribution that we submitted are most road-based, you know? So we've got mass rapid transit, public utility vehicle modernization program. Of course, you also submitted the railway project and the motor vehicle inspection system. At this point, I'd like to just say that when we submitted it, we did not submit it solely. Uh, well, when we, when we crafted the intervention, it had always been the environment protection, environmental protection as a co-benefit but it's always about improving people's commute, improving travel of people in the urban area. Let me just give you a little bit, um, just a little bit of discussion on the PUD modernization program. The Public Utility Vehicle Modernization Program is actually um, one of its main objectives because it has 10 components. It's actually to improve uh, the the jeepney, and so if you've been to the Philippines, you've seen our jeepneys, these are iconic, but they're also very heavy, pollute, uh, heavy pollutants. 
And so the, the fleet modernization is to upgrade our traditional cities, and, which do not have CCTV, GPS, dashboard cameras, and they are not PW, are elderly friendly, and we use manual payment to a more modern Jeep, to modernize GPs with side doors. Now, if you've seen our Jeepneys, uh, you would board at the back, and this has been proven to be very dangerous. And it has CCTV, GPS, as well as dashboard camera. And because we are really implementing that they can board and alight on you know, the right stations, then it becomes BW as well as persons with disabilities and elderly friendly. All right, moving forward, um, moving forward, if you notice, of course, that was just the first step of our NDC. But looking at the NDC expansion of the PUVMP, you would see that it's still anchored on fuel efficiency. However, the reduction of GHG can actually be more maximized, can be maximized through the convergence to e mobility. Where are we in terms of e mobility? In 2019, this would be the stock based on the Land Transport Office data. As you can see, we have a lot of electric uh, tricycles, the three wheelers, and e-motorcycles, the two wheelers, but very few in public transportation. The critical factors for increasing convergence to e-mobility in the Philippines would have to be the in electric vehicle uptake in the public utility vehicle modernization program and integration in the, in, of green route in the local tra public transportation route plans. What is a green route? A green route is like, a, it's kind of like a, a route that vehicles, electric vehicles and, uh, that are environment friendly can have use of that route. So it makes them faster. They have, um, they have uh, priority over that. Another one is the implementation of a bill that uh, of a law where of, of the electric vehicle law, which among others, this is very important, legislates the, the, the development of a comprehensive roadmap on electric vehicles. There is also a need for an uh, increased participation and investment of the private sector. I'd like, I'd like to just share with you what have been the challenges. The challenges, of course, have been to the public utility vehicle program is that the drivers refuse to actually change their old jeepneys to new jeepneys, to the modern jeepneys, precisely because they found it very expensive. So the solution has been to increase vehicle subsidy actually from 60,000 pesos to 120,000 pesos, as well as the formation of cooperatives. The lack of policy to support transition to electric vehicle, as I've mentioned earlier, I'm not going to repeat it, is really for the implementation of the electric vehicle legislation that has recently been passed. Another challenge, though, is the lack of data to simulate decarbonization scenarios. And so therefore, we're now looking at um, updating the GHG inventory. I forgot to mention that one of the powerful uh, one of the advantages, or for me, it's also power of the public, well, the pump or the urban mobility plan is the fact that it includes indicators that you can actually, you can actually use to determine whether you have, uh, you have been successful in that particular aspect. Another challenge in, in the Philippines, particularly now in the pandemic, is because of the reduced, um, the uh, passenger capacity, the drivers, the public transport drivers now refuse to run because it's no longer viable. So we have actually gone into service contracting where we contract the drivers to just run the service based on vehicle kilometers, regardless of whether we have passengers or no passengers. This is a, this is now the um the difference in the previous previous system where you get paid based on the number of passengers. I'd like to end my sharing by looking at one of the components, and I can't go back, I'm sorry, it's too far back, but one of the components of the Philippine Urban Mobility, Urban Mobility Program is actually the inclusion of the transit-oriented development. 
because in creating low carbon communities, it is imperative that the land use and transport interaction is looked into. Hence, in the 2017 to 2022 National Urban Development and Housing Framework, transit-oriented development was actually adopted as a principle where it was defined as a well-developed pedestrian and cycling facilities connected to transport terminals and high-density walkable districts within 10-minute walk circle around the transport station. Now, there are also a, a policy yeah, a policy is now being developed by the, well, now they're called the Department of Issues, of Urban Housing and Development, okay? And uh, the policy is now being developed to integrate this strategy in the comprehensive land use plan of local areas. That's about it for me. Thank you very much. <laughs>